How's it going everybody? Ed Ricker here and I'm in front of my 3D printers. They're not printing right now for the sake of audio, but they've been working very hard the last couple days printing PPE or personal protective equipment for medical personnel in my area. Now there are many videos on YouTube, uh, people telling how to print face shields, how to print masks, how to print other types of PPE depending on the demand in your local area. But how do you find that demand? And how do you find other people near you who might also be printing that you can join up with and kind of work together to kind of create a standardization of, of the process and of the, the objects that you're making and deliver those to the medical centers that need the most? Well, maskfordocs.com is one way. Um, it's an organization that really helps to organize these groups of 3D printers. And honestly, I would have never known how many people in Raleigh also had 3D printers and were working toward this goal had one of my friends, Alex, not told me about Mask for Docs. Um, Sean leads the Raleigh and the Chapel Hill chapter of uh, Masks for Docs. And along with Alex, uh, they're gonna be joining the video later on, but uh, they're doing a great job of kind of making sure that we're churning out a lot of these and working together as a team, making sure we're all printing the same objects uh, that need to be printed, uh, kind of monitoring where the demand is, who needs what, when, and where. First of all, this is the hot item. This is the one in demand the most. And if you have a print bed big enough to print something like this, this is a uh, band, like a headband, but what it does, it holds a transparent sheet around the headband. And so if you wear it like this, you've got transparent plastic, comes down below your chin, and it's a face shield. And it blocks droplets in the air or some other contaminant that's heading your way. And many medical centers in the area are pretty much taking as many as we can give them. Of course, N95 masks are becoming a little bit more harder to come by. So a lot of uh, medical centers may be starting to run out. This may also help. I print two of these at a time on my Soval SV01. It takes about an hour for two. And then also I'm, you do, I'm making ear savers. So this is uh, what would uh, hook onto two of the elastic pieces of a mask and it wraps around the back of your head so your ears are no longer supporting the elastic band of a mask. If you don't have a print bed big enough for this design, like say the Flash Forge Creator Max here, which does not fit this size of a, uh, of a headband here, I can print five of these ear savers at a time right here. It takes about an hour and a half. Now, the Raleigh Triangle chapter of Mask for Docs um, has actually volunteers who will sanitize and put the transparent film on these bands to create the full completed uh, face mask, the face shield, and then volunteers to drive them over to these uh, specific medical centers that have expressed the need, the demand for these types of things. Now my friend Alex, who I fly drones with, introduced me to Sean, who's pretty much the team lead or the, the chapter lead of Masks for Docs in Raleigh, North Carolina. I got them both on Zoom, asked them some questions. Here's that conversation. So we have Sean and Alex here who are working uh, tirelessly uh, making 3D printed PPE for local uh, medical centers in Raleigh, North Carolina and the surrounding areas. Sean and Alex, we'll start with Sean, you first. Um, introduce yourself, tell me a little bit about uh, how you got started with uh, Mass for Docs, but, but also just uh, how you got started with uh, printing uh, PPE here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I got into this very similar to what we had talked about earlier, which is, I thought this was solved. I thought there was people working on this. There's a lot of people with a lot more skills in building things than I have, being in like technology and coding. And uh, then I got text, I'm on a group text like a lot of families have with their family. And my sisters, uh, my younger sisters are both PAs, physician assistants. They were just freaking out. They just did not have equipment. They were starting to get COVID patients they were kind of having panic attacks, to be honest, because they just weren't getting equipment they wanted. I have a couple guys in my running group that are surgeons. Um, they're not ER surgeons, um, but they, they work at UNC and they're starting to do kind of like uh, different um, shifts. And they're kind of freaking out and getting anxious because it's not clear what equipment they have and don't have when they show up for a shift. Like sometimes they show up for a shift, they like don't know what's gonna be there when they show up. I went on Twitter and I kind of did a broadcast on Twitter and Facebook and other social media trying to figure out like, what do I do? And a random friend of a friend of a friend on Twitter, one of those like retweet things goes, have you seen Mass for Docs? And uh, I joined that. I had been kind of venting into like a, like a Slack chat room we have for the, for the, the team at my company. And uh, someone said, oh, I saw a, a mail. There's some folks at Red Hat that are already doing this and trying to help. And that's how I met Alex. And he had been doing this locally. Like we had just, I think, four of us 
and only three of us with printers. Um, and we got some printers out of our, our work and over to Alex's house. You can put them. I think, how many do you have now, Alex? In your... I've got a couple of printers that I had before and a couple of extras that you helped me secure. So Yeah, so we're at yeah. four, four printers there. I have one. So I'm new to 3D printing, and I can now print 12 face bands a day, and I've never done 3D printing before. So it's something that people can get started fairly quickly. Now there's, I think, almost 30, 30 people in the Slack channel trying to to create equipment. I have another 10, 12 people signed up through a website that we created. Alex, um, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got started because I first saw your blog post and you talked about, you know, what you need and the steps in order to do all this properly. Um, what filament, what's the, the, the model, the STL that we're working with right now. So what was the impetus that made you kind of join in on this effort and, uh, you know, eventually get to where you guys are churning out so many per day? It was a, a video by the 3D printing nerd. He's out of Seattle and uh, he's got a, a whole 3D printing channel. Washington State was a good, I don't know, 10 days, maybe more behind North Carolina. And his video at that point was about five or six days old. And I thought, hmm, if they're finding it useful a week ago, well, maybe we'll find it useful in a week's time. Mm -hmm. How much would it take to print one of these things? And I'd seen the, des the design by Joseph Prusia uh, the guy that makes all the orange 3D printers like the one I have behind me. And they're based out of Prague in the Czech Republic. And they did a bunch of work with the Czech health authorities to get them certified uh, with um, local healthcare. Because that's the other thing you have to be aware of is that because a lot of these uh, healthcare um, places are companies, they have very strict rules about donations and what can and can't be accepted. Um and so I just thought, you know what, screw all this. I'm just going to start printing. I'm going to print a very simple design, um, which is actually this one here, which is called the 3D Verkstan design, I think is a guy out of Sweden. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to print one of these uh, headbands. You can see that I just popped it right off the bed right then. Um, it has a few little prongs on it, which uh, very simply, you just need a hole punch and an overhead projector transparency sheet to make the simplest version of these. Um, and the assembly takes maybe a minute or two. Uh, so very quickly, my wife and I could see a way that we could actually make a difference in this pandemic. And for us, you know, having only recently emigrated 18 months ago, uh, we're looking at our family in England going, oh, the NHS, you know, I wish we could help well, hold on, we can help where we are. Why not be part of this community? And, um, you know, for me, this uh, is a very small way of helping, but I started posting on things like Nextdoor and Facebook, and I wrote a blog post to help other people I knew, like drone racers that have 3D printers. Um, and the response has been overwhelming. We've raised hundreds of dollars already uh, to, to buy filament for this stuff. So one of these bands is about 12 or 13 grams worth of filament. And these rolls, uh, I'm doing it in a mirror. <laughs> these rolls here are come in one kilogram spools and they are called uh, PETG filament. I Don't ask me what it stands for, but it's the same type of plastic that you make a cola bottle out of or something like that. It's, it's, um, it's quite, uh, it's not very brittle. It can withstand high temperatures and can therefore be sterilized properly. Mm, okay. Now, originally I started printing out of PLA that I had on hand. It was very forgiving to print with, um, PETG can be a little more tricky if you're not, you know, a, a nerd at printing. <laughs> um, it's not too bad. But um, I, I don't really see these as long-term devices. I see these as very short-term, possibly even single-use. I, I mean, I'd love it if they could be used for even two or three days or two or three shift changes. Uh, I don't know how realistic that is. My, my goal here, our goal here, is to just give p people something. Because in our opinion, something is better than nothing, you know. Um, and whether it goes to the American Airlines hostess that saw my post on Nextdoor that lives around the corner from me, she's now going on airplanes with a face shield. Or whether it's the behavioral psychology therapist that lives around the corner from me that picked up half a dozen because her clients throw feces at her and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm. As long as if we can get even you know, one or two people to prevent from getting sick in this situation. I think it's totally worth all of the effort that we've gone to. Gotcha. And so do we have any hard numbers on the amount of uh, shields that have been printed and delivered, um, either of you? 
I can do about 50 or 60 a day of these little things uh, across the three or four printers that I have working at the moment. Uh, it's roughly four an hour, give or take four or five an hour. Uh, so far, I've personally delivered 250-ish, uh, but I've got nearly 500 in the box behind me ready to go. So Logistics, I think, is now the hard part. So we're just trying to standardize the prints and then manage the logistics. The triangle is a huge region that's not very dense. So some people put like, I live in Raleigh, but like it might be an hour to drive from one side of Raleigh to the other side. So I'm starting to try to map this out to create a supply chain. So like today we have one person drive it from like outside Cocoa Booth Amphitheater over to Apex. And then that, that guy's going to drive it to my house. So each of us is like shortening that like two hour commute down to like 20 minute increments as they kind of keep spooling up stuff. Um, and now we're also working with the lab in, in Durham. They can create tons and tons of, uh, of the transparent face shield part. So we're starting to try to coordinate this so we can not burn each other out. So we're going crazy, <laughs> but also be a lot more efficient and smarter about it. Uh, draft quality prints. Um, are they more difficult to sanitize? I mean, sometimes I've been printing some of these bands and I've got lines and divots and a little pit in some of those little pin areas where the punch out is for the transparent sheet. Does any of that matter? Or like Alex mentioned, these might just be single use. I think if we were doing this as a business, as a long-term sort of protection thing and reuse was a huge part of our concerns. Yes, I would say print quality is important. Uh, if you think about the requirements here, it's to have something in front of someone's face to prevent particles from just, you know, being fired at them. I don't think it's important. I mean, I, I think quantity is more important than quality at this point, because in two to three weeks, hopefully less, um, the vacuum form molds will be online and they will be able to print out thousands of, uh, you know, thousands a minute. Whereas the, the entire reason that we, we're doing this right now is just to give people something. And mm -hmm. I think something is better than nothing. Gotcha. Okay. And then can you talk about the precautions that someone should take when they're setting up, um, you know, a couple printers in their house and they want to make sure that what they deliver is not contaminated with the virus. Any way that you guys are doing that at the home or once you take it out, that's sterilized when they put them together with the uh, transparent sheets. I just advise people to give them a wipe down, you know, with some Clorox or some IPA if they have it, isopropyl alcohol. Um, I try and leave everything in a box for three days before I say it's available to anybody else. Because if I've touched it like I just did with these, uh, you want to treat it almost as if you have a virus. I have no reason to believe that I do have it, but, you know, who knows? Um, so you want to treat it as if you do have it and it would... <laughs> It would be kind of counterproductive to be a conduit for the virus to all these healthcare workers, right? So right. you want exactly. to be careful. If you can put things in a Ziploc bag, that's going to be beneficial as well. Um, just, you know, basic common sense, I would say. The image quality labs, there's two guys from there using a kind of workplace. They actually have a sanitized kind of program they're doing now as we give them visors. So now we can kind of keep them from driving around and delivering and just keep printing them visors where they put shields on and then sanitize. I also agree like three days, um, at least three hours without touching anyone else where it's off. Um, kind of follow the same rules as we do for food, right? If you're getting food delivery or, or something, kind of just keep it, keep it sane. Um, these aren't replacements face shields for N95 masks. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something, it's not actually a particulate filter. It's just a splatter shield, like sneeze guard, blood guard. A, a lot of times things like those N95 masks are redirected to COVID wards. And so it leaves people who aren't on COVID wards with nothing. And so, like I said at the beginning, it's, it's just a case of giving people something. Something mm -hmm. is better than nothing. And I think that's been largely the driving force behind all of our motivations is to, you know, just try and help where we can. When I first talked with you guys and I had mentioned oh, the printer that is working right now can't even fit the model that you guys are using for the headband on my print bed. My print bed's too small. And then you said, oh, well, try ear savers. You had another idea, something smaller that you can use on smaller print beds. Are there other ideas for someone who's like, man, I just don't have a print bed big enough for that. What can I, what can I print? What can I uh, do with my smaller printer? These ear savers are 
uh, are amazing. My my sister's back in England, and she has a, a friend who's a doctor who saw my Facebook post about these things, and she she ordered. Uh, she said, "Can I order a hundred from you?" So what I did, I got in touch with an old drone racing friend in England who's printed them out for her, and they're going to mail them in England. But um, I mean, if you stop and think about the power of the internet of what I've just said, yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? We can mass manufacture little things like this in our in our homes. But these are very simple little devices. They just go around the back of your head. So this is the back of my head now. Uh, and there's little prongs here. You hook the elastic for the mask over and it just saves the back of your ears from, you know, if you've worn a mask for even five minutes, you know it sucks. So the, these things are <laughs> super simple little things that we can, you know, I can do a, a, a bed load overnight. It takes about three hours. Um, and uh, it costs about, I don't know, it's about 20 grams worth of filament, so it's a few cents. You know, mm -hmm. So they're super cheap to make, um, and they're just a, a nice little quality of life thing for those people on the, the front lines and people that got to wear masks all the time. For people who are looking for more information on how to help wherever they can, whether in this country or around the world, YouTube, you, know, you never know who's watching, how would someone find more information on how to get started? Uh, maybe it's through Mask for Docs uh, or through their own local chapter of something else, but... What do you suggest? How, how do people find more information about what's already taking place in their community that they can join in on that process? The problem is there's like so many. I think Master Docs is obviously a really good one just because the Slack community is huge. Um, that's one that I found. Like just using their Slack. And they have, kind of have Autobots set up now. So when you join and they kind of figure out where you are, if you make your profile, they'll tell you where your local channel is and who your community lead is. Usually there's someone within that community doing something already and just trying to find and map out those people and, and kind of work with them and help them. It's just, just a way. Um, I use Twitter to find folks, find it. I'm trying to standardize for us, right? Like we have a website, trianglecovid.com. Like I put together, just trying to help organize this, but I'm trying to standardize the, the, um, the hashtags to what better every day was using, which is hashtag your city fighting COVID. Hmm. And what you'll see is I noticed Right when I started searching that is there was already people in Raleigh doing that that could not find people. So what I did is responded with like, hey, this is what we're doing. Join Slack. Here's our email. Here's my email. Like, reach out if you want to help. If we can just save one life or keep one person from getting sick or just making one person like feel like their community is supporting them when they have to go to work and do something. Um, there's a like mental health thing there too, right? Like. Alex is making his neighbors feel appreciated and like that they're human beings and they're just as important as everyone else. And I think that's a huge, a huge win for our community. It's just making people feel like they are safe. Well, Sean and Alex, thanks so much for being on. Uh, we appreciate everything you do and I'm looking forward to sharing the information you've shared with us um, around YouTube. So thanks for being on. So I hope this video, this conversation gave you some insight into what you can do with 3D printing to do your part and get involved. Um, links in the video description to masksfordocs.com as well as my friend Alex's blog post that gives a lot of great detailed step-by-step -step information on how to print some of these face shields. I'm also going to include links to these printers. Um, I'll be making a video about this one coming up soon. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and happy printing.